This universe is finite, its resource is finite. If life is left unchecked, life will cease to exist. That's Thanos, the Marvel supervillain who kills half of all humanity with the snap of his fingers in Avengers Infinity War. As Marion Tupi and Gal Pooley argue in their new book, Superabundance, Thanos is channeling millennia-old critiques of progress and population growth. He's also flat out wrong. The past 200 years have seen historically huge increases in the number of people living on planet Earth. In 1800, there were 1 billion people. Now there are 8 billion. We are flourishing more than ever before and living longer, more productive lives. Tupi and Pooley chart how the real prices of our most basic necessities and virtually all luxuries have declined over time and how free markets and human innovation mean that our planet is infinitely bountiful. Gail Pooley, Marion Tupi, thanks for talking to Reason. My pleasure. Uh, Glad to be here. All right. So uh, let's start with the elevator pitch for Superabundance, the story of population growth, innovation, and human flourishing on an infinitely bountiful planet. Uh, Marion, why don't you start? What's, what's the elevator pitch for this book? Well, people have been wondering about the relationship between uh, resource abundance and population growth for at least two and a half thousand years. The ancient Egyptians, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, the ancient Greeks thought about it. Uh, the ancient Romans thought about it. The Chinese thought about it. The Indians thought about it. And uh, really, uh, people have always had this sort of ambiguous feeling about population growth. But 200 years ago, and really over the last 200 years specifically, since Thomas Malthus published his mm -hmm. famous uh, essay on the principle of population, most people have been generally negative uh, to, to our population mm -hmm. growth. In other words, there was an expectation that as population grew, resources would become more expensive, therefore scarcer, and there would be some kind of calamity, mm -hmm. maybe running out of food, the you know starvation, the, the, the world would be, uh, would be destroyed as we know it. Now, in the last 200 years specifically, between 1800 and 2022, uh, population of the world has increased from 1 billion people to 8 billion mm -hmm. people. And yet, what we found uh, in our book by looking at hundreds of different commodities, uh, fuels, minerals, uh, metals, even finished goods and some services, everything has become cheaper in terms of time price. People simply have to work less and less time in order to buy things which, uh, which are essential goods and commodities in order to survive. Things are just getting cheaper. Yeah. And that tells us that uh, every human being on average creates more value than he or she consumes. That uh, human beings are inventors and innovators, and they can create more value uh, for everyone, okay. thereby increasing standards of living. Oh, and, and that is, I mean, we'll get into this, but you guys spend a lot of time documenting the great enrichment, which is the term that uh, Deirdre McCloskey and other economic historians have used for the past 200 years, roughly the period of industrialization where, uh, you know, things went from being pretty flat for a thousand years or more to getting better and better. Gail, one of the, the kind of uh, uh, figure, the, uh, you know, the uh, spirit animal of your book is Julian Simon. Can you explain who he is and why he's so important to the, uh, to the project here? Well, Julian Simon actually uh, was this obscure kind of economist and uh, was teaching at university. And um, there was a book that was published in 1968 by uh, Stanford biologist uh, Paul Ehrlich. And it uh, the title was uh, The Population Bomb. And he makes these claims about, look, we're facing this extinction because there are too many people. And Julian actually s said that he, when he originally read the book, he thought, well, this... Uh, this theory seems to be reasonable, but as he began to kind of check uh, the facts, what he discovered, uh, he said to his surprise, is that as population increased, all these resources became even more abundant. So uh, he and Ehrlich began to have this quite public dispute about what was going to happen in the future. What is that relationship between population and resources? And it finally ended up in a bet. And Julian said, uh, look, uh, pick any non-renewable resource for any period over a year, and I'll bet you that it's going to become more abundant. In other words, the price is going to fall adjusted for inflation. 
And so Ehrlich picks uh, uh, five uh, metals, copper, chromium, nickel, tin, and tungsten. And they, they had this bet for a 10-year period from 1980 to 1990. And that's when, when Julian really, you know, put this kind of issue at the forefront. And, um, you know, as professors, we, could, we kind of get away with saying whatever we, we want to say, never really be yeah. held accountable for it. So he, he really made Ehrlich accountable for what he'd claimed. And at the end of that 10-year period, uh, Ehrlich had to write uh, Simon a check for $576. The, the, real the price good news it. is the check was worth a lot less you know, when the bet finished than when it started. So in that way, uh, Ehrlich kind of won, right? <laughs> well, it was adjusted for inflation. So you okay. know, he, so. he actually did. He did. But the original bet, Julian says, well, I'll bet you like $10,000. And, yeah. and those guys said, well... Uh, I mean, Julian says, how about just a thousand? It's just the principle. It's not the amount. And they were really opposed to him lowering the bet and he ended up saving them, you know, uh, Fair amount <laughs> they of would money. have yeah, lost and, 10 uh, times more. Simon, so, who who spent most of his academic career, I guess, at uh, University of Maryland teaching as a business professor, was lionized in early issues of, of uh, Wired magazine in the early 90s as the doom slayer because he was against a kind of generalized intellectual background um, of, of people, a cast of characters who were saying, you know what, like the world is running out of everything. It's, you know, it's running out of space. It's running out of air. It's running out of climate. It's running out of minerals and, you know, precious metals, et cetera. Simon said no. And he then went on to talk about humans as the ultimate resource, right? And that is really you know, that, I mean, this is kind of the, the foundation upon which you, you guys are planting or building your, your case for super abundance. Can you uh, tell uh, either of you, could you explain the concept of time price? Because that is also central to the way that you measure whether or not things are becoming more or less abundant, more or less available, you know, more expensive or less expensive. So, uh, yeah, Marion, you want me to talk about it? Yes. Go, go for okay, it. Okay, yeah. so uh, time price basically b- begins with this idea is, look, as we, we buy things with money, but we really pay for them with time. You know, mm-hmm. how much time does it take you to earn the money to buy that thing? So there's a money price that you can express in dollars and cents, but there's a time price that you can express in hours and minutes. And so we felt like, look, if we can go to time prices, it's mm-hmm. it offers really five advantages over money prices. First of all, a, a time price more fully captures because the time price equation is, is real simple. It's just how much did it cost you divided by what's your hourly income. Mm-hmm. So if something costs uh, $20 and you're earning $20 an hour, the time price of that thing is 60 minutes. So then right. the question is what's happening to that time price over time for you or for the category that you're in? And so we, we move to these time prices. And because it's this ratio of the two variables, you're more fully capturing innovation. When innovation shows up, it not only shows up in lower prices, it also shows up in higher incomes. So it more fully captures innovation. The second feature is you can transcend all of these issues, all these this contention about CPI and GDP deflator, mm-hmm. all of those you can transcend. Uh, third uh, value is you can go to any country with any currency look at any product at any time and calculate a time price. I can go back to France in 1850 and figure out what the time price was for a loaf of bread and compare it to the time price today. The the fourth advantage is time is this universal constant. It's not, you can't inflate it. You can't counterfeit it. Of the seven fundamental majors in science, six of them go back to time. It's a second of time. It's this fundamental feature. So if we can move economics from thinking of money to thinking in time, I think we then allow that discipline to become more scientific. And then the last reason is that time, we have this perfect equality of time. We all get 24 hours a day. So people mm-hmm. then think, people think in time and they, they think relative time. So if we can measure people instead of income inequality, if we can think about time inequality, I think it's much more informative and revealing in terms of what kind of life we have. Yeah. Okay. Um, what about the uh, question, just very quickly on this, the using time prices, you know, how do, I mean, is, is it capable, are we capable of, uh, you know, really comparing life today in terms of what we spend money on, what we spend time on and, you know, 1800 France or, 
you know, the ancient, I mean, we, ha- we all have more computing power than the ancient pharaohs of Egypt, uh, you know, but do we lose something when we just focus on, you know, everything as a function of the average, you know, the average uh, wage given to the average laborer in a given period? Um, uh, you know, no, no, no prices, no measurement is perfect, uh, but there are, there are, there are, there are some very important uh, things for which time price is ideal, um, especially things which are of greatest importance to the least fortunate among us, be they in America or be they in Ghana. Uh, a, a bag of potatoes is the same um, uh, today as it was in 1700 Germany. A bag of oranges is the same today as it was in as, as it is in Ghana. Um, we are measuring uh, basic food items, and mm-hmm. we are always very careful to compare like with like bananas with bananas, mm-hmm. oranges with oranges, a pound of beef with a pound of beef. Uh, we don't look at uh, you know Lamborghinis mm-hmm. or yachts. Uh, we look at things that people need for their ordinary daily survival, uh, especially when it comes to fuels um, and uh, food and certain minerals and metals. Because, of course, you cannot eat a pound of aluminum or a pound of copper, uh, but they are all part of processes of production that, of course, uh, inputs, uh, which make uh, outputs cheaper. Um, so, so, so in that sense, in that sense, we think we are on pretty solid ground. Once you switch over from basic commodities to um, to services, especially, things get more complicated. Right. One reason is that uh, services uh, contain much more uh, of the price of a service is contained in human labor right. or is determined by human labor. And if there is one thing that we have noticed in superabundance that continues to increase in price, it is human labor. Mm-hmm. And so the more human labor um, is part of the prices, say, for example, a ha- ha- hairdresser, uh, then, uh, then, uh, then superabundance uh, would would not necessarily show itself right. as strongly. Finally, um, I would say that um, uh, that when it comes to services, uh, the quality of services is very different. So a trip to the dentist is very different than it was, say, hundred years ago. Okay. That being I, said, I can tell you from uh, personal experience from twenty five <laughs> years ago, Marion. You know, some of us remember before. dentistry when it was still at the barber shop. Yeah, it was not good. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, we, uh, and, and, and just a final point. So, so, but we did look. We tried did did try to estimate one type of service, mm-hmm. and that is uh, cosmetic surgery. And 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 a listener may ask, well, why on earth would you worry yourself mm-hmm. about that? And that is because we are conscious of the fact that in America, whilst food and electronics and things like that are becoming cheaper education and healthcare is right. definitely becoming more expensive relative to wages so what we wanted to see is what would happen to a quote unquote medical procedure mm-hmm. if it is subject if it is subjected to the proper functioning of the market right. you pay for it it's largely deregulated and what we found is that when it comes to plastic surgery or cosmetic surgery um they are growing in abundance at a super abundant right. rate. Everything is becoming cheaper when the market is allowed to function. What um, is there, uh, or explain when you talk about abundance versus super abundance, what's, what's the uh, kind of Maginot line that you're crossing there? <laughs> That's a great phrase, the Maginot yeah. line. The Maginot line is the rate of growth of population. Right. So Ehrlich was claiming that as population grew, everything would be becoming more expensive and therefore abundance would be declining. Mm-hmm. What we found in superabundance is that everything is actually growing in abundance, at least the things that we have measured. But abundance can be growing at two different speeds. It can be growing at a lower rate than population mm-hmm. growth or a higher rate than population growth. And what we found was that it it almost invariably grows at a higher rate than population yeah. growth. So if you have population growth of 2%, but abundance is increasing of 3 or 4%, that's superabundance. Right. And the gap between population growth and superabundance, that tells you that human beings create this new knowledge which is capable of increasing standards of living. Uh, and I'll just, uh, before we move off of time prices very quickly, I mean, one of the things I was going to say is that in a way you guys are also underselling the, uh, you know, the, the improvement of certain things, because when you think about something like a car and you can go back certainly a hundred years, but even 20 or 30 years, 
when uh, you know the car we are buying now generally with less time price, um, you know when you think about it that way, the car is just phenomenally better. Uh, you know the computer is phenomenally better uh, than it was twenty or thirty years ago. That's a shortcoming of time prices, yeah. and it's also a shortcoming of every single right. other price. Yeah. Nobody knows how to properly adjust for improvements in quality. Right. Um, okay. So what are, um, well, uh, you know, it, at the beginning of the book, you, you invoke Malthus. I mean, you invoke Julian Simon on the plus side, kind of, uh, and a couple of other people, and you invoke Malthus on the, the negative side and Thanos, uh, the uh, supervillain from uh, the Avengers movies, and he goes a long way back in the Marvel comic book industry. Summarize Thanos. Like, why Why do you start with Thanos? Why is Thanos kind of the anti-Julian Simon? Well, we like Thanos uh, because he kind of, he illustrates this, this ideology of scarcity. And he makes a statement about the universe is finite and its resources are finite. He's, he's correct on the first part. You know, we do live on a planet with a fixed number of physical atoms. But the second part of his uh, his statement's wrong because resources aren't a function of atoms. Their p- atoms are important, but resources are really a function of knowledge. It's when we, you take the material world, atoms, and you organize them and you add knowledge to them, that's when they become uh, resources. And that knowledge is really what creates their value. The, the quote from uh, Thomas Sowell about the, the Neanderthal or George Gilder, a little shorty, says the, the difference between our age and the Stone Age is entirely due to the growth of knowledge. We're not getting more atoms. What we're getting is more knowledge. Well, if that's the case, then uh, we don't really have this, this limit in terms of, of resources because knowledge doesn't have any kind of a, doesn't appear to have any kind of limit. I want to say this, and I mean this as a completely positive statement, but you guys are absolutely 100% satanic in in making that claim and Promethean. Uh, it's almost chilling to hear it, but it's, you know, I, I agree with you completely, but this, that is a kind of optimism uh, that has just really gone missing from, you know, virtually all kind of public discussions of, of, you know, the world we live in and progress versus uh, stagnation and whatnot. So, uh, so just, Nick, Nick, yeah. Nick, are you saying Satan was optimistic? Is that what you're... Uh, well, now what I'm saying is, you know, <laughs> I don't that, know if uh, I can go with that or not. The fire stealer, you know, <laughs> yeah. is, is the person, yeah. I mean, you, you are, you know, Prometheus. this, yeah, it is, a, you know, a fascinating and almost, uh, you know, I, I was raised Catholic, so I get a little bit nervous when I hear this kind of stuff, but the hair on my neck stands up because, you're totally right. This is, you know, human humanity or, or intelligence is the difference maker. And, um, you know, and it is limitless, potentially. Um, what are, uh, uh, give me like three of the best examples of where we have gone, you know, and in, in, in time price and things like that. What are three of the best indicators that, you know, compared to 1800 or even 1900, maybe better, you know, that we are just doing so much better in ways that surprise and stun people? So, uh, looking at a blue-collar worker, um, uh, the, the, this the, this particular uh, chart we looked at resources relative to uh, blue-collar worker uh, wages, mm-hmm. and um, what we found, for example, is that in terms of time prices, uh, rice has declined by ninety-nine percent in terms of how much time you have to you have to work in order to buy a pound of rice. And that means that now you get 112 pounds of rice for the same amount of work that would have bought you one right. pound of rice in 18. I mean, it's, it, I I mean it's almost as if it is now free. And I know, you know that's an overstatement, but you talk in the book about how uh, you know, such a large percentage of people's time and effort went to food and it just is now it's it's a shrinking and small percentage um and and you translate that at some point in the book you talk about the average calories of you know people in you know in uh, the ancient regime in france in france the wealthy people were eating like 1600 calories a day the typical frenchman now you know it has you know eats 3500 or something like that yeah um i'm uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, for example, the average calorie intake today is the same what it was in Portugal in 1960s. Mm-hmm. So that gives you a sense of how much better fed we are. Now, the, the now, 
one of the things that we do, we translate time prices into abundance. And there is a reason for that. People intuitively understand that if something increases in price by 100%, you are only going to get half as much Mm -hmm. of it as before. But people don't quite understand, or rather it's counterintuitive to think that when something falls in price by by 100%, it becomes free. Right. The, basically, the abundance of it becomes infinite. Yeah. So in, in comparing 1850 to 2018, what we found was a number, um, uh, number of different uh, commodities. I'm just going to name them. Uh, sugar, nickel, rice, tea, rye, palm oil, pork, cotton, wheat, cocoa, um, which have fallen by 99%. Yeah. And on average, on average, uh, it's by about 98%. Right. So if, if you had to work for something uh, for, for 100 minutes to buy it in 1850, you now have to work two minutes to buy right. it. And that, that translates into multiple uh, multiple number of pounds of things that you can get now as opposed to before. But it's also true that you don't actually, you don't, you don't eat 112 pounds of rice, right? Um, in, in, in a profound way, and I mean, I think the book gets at this in a, in a pretty spectacular way, what it does is it opens up you know, all of the time that, you know, they, instead of spending two minutes working for food or for palm oil or something like that, you now have, you know, 58 minutes in an hour to uh, do other things. Right. Right. It's this time of, it's uh, this I think time, Gail has a very interesting example. Yeah. It's, it's the time abundance that we're really enjoying mm-hmm. as well. We get this time abundance and we get a choice abundance. So if you, uh, we go back to 1960 and look at somebody living in India and assume they spend eight hours a day, and a lot of these guys were. They're they're making ninety dollars a year GDP per year mm-hmm. per capita. So they spend their whole day working to earn enough rice to subsist on. Uh, today, you know, the price of rice falls by eighty or ninety percent. They only have to spend an hour a day, so they end up with six more hours a day that they can now devote to something else, to learning, right. to earning to earning the money to buy a bicycle. They get to move out of that time scarcity into this more time abundant zone where Mm -hmm. now they're much more similar to someone in the U S yeah, we've enjoyed this, this reduction in time prices too, but they've really benefited from it because now they're, they're not spending all of their time devoted to just sustaining this kind of basic level of, of, of Mm -hmm. life support of just food. So this compression of time, this time equality has become much more narrower uh, over time. And that we, we believe is a huge benefit. When you give people, 2 billion people between China and India, the freedom to have five or six or seven more hours a day to devote, they then become creators, uh, potentially, mm-hmm. to, to grow and discover new knowledge. What's a, yeah, I would go only ahead. add that, that I would only add to that that the cool thing about studying economic development and the workings of capitalism uh, in in the Second World War era, but especially since since globalization about forty years ago, is to see the different kinds of inequalities which have just collapsed. The left continues to obsess about income inequality, but look at uh, the gap between uh, between infants dying in the third world and in 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 the west how much it has shrunk maternal mortality time inequality calorie inequality mm-hmm. there are hundreds of different inequalities which are shrinking around the world as a result of economic development so uh, even though uh, income inequality may still be increasing in some countries right. even income inequality across the world right has and income inequality so, among in- countries is shrinking correct yeah. yes Yes, within countries, uh, it, 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 it is increasing. Yeah. I mean, it's, okay. but that's in, in, bizarre because it's kind of it's increasing within China, but the difference between China and the United States is shrinking. Yes, yes, and part of the reason for that is, of course, that if you want to unleash your economic potential, you have to allow individual human beings to apply their brains, and some of them are going to be more successful mm-hmm. than others. So naturally, what you, you, you are here, and then some people in a free market environment are going to come mm-hmm. up um, much at much faster rate than others. But the society as a whole is then going to catch up with the United States. So, you know, trade-offs. Um- you know, let's uh, talk a little bit about the uh, the engines or the engine or engines of superabundance. Um, and we're going to talk about the critics of it and kind of where we go 
forward. If we like superabundance, how do we get more of it rather than less of it in, in, a, in a little bit? But you know, what are, what are the main engines of superabundance that you lay out in the book? Well, really two. Yeah, two. It's, a, you know, we believe that abundance is a function of population and the freedom to innovate. Right. And uh, you can have an increase in population, but, but if they're not free to innovate, you really don't have this increase in abundance. But if you add a small measure of, of freedom, for example, the China, the China situation, you suddenly see people begin to escape poverty because of this ability to now, uh, this freedom to innovate, which is really the freedom to go out and discover and mm-hmm. activate a valuable new knowledge. Innovation is really this discovery of new knowledge. And then Let's it has talk to be a little activated. bit about population growth first, though, because uh, it, at one point in the book, you talk about how between uh, 1800 and 1900, uh, the population of Europe, uh, and I don't have it exactly in front of me, you guys might remember it, but it, it, I mean, it more than doubled, I think. Um, at, in a century where Europe became much wealthier. Um, so what is the role of population in creating more abundance? Innovation is a function of invention, and invention is a function of ideas, and ideas are a function of human, human beings. So mm-hmm. you've got to have human beings to be able to have this idea uh, creation and discovery process, and then they have to have the freedom to act on those ideas. And then so those basically, ideas- this is like having, you know, in the uh, the example, and I'll butcher it, but you know, about how you know having a million monkeys or an infinite number of monkeys at an infinite number of keyboards, you'll get, you know, Shakespeare written. Basically, by having more monkeys, by having more people, you have more kind of random choice generators who are going to come up with a better way of doing something. Yeah, I think. In a way, in a way, because right. it's only a fraction of society that ever innovates, right. that has the idea leading to inventions and innovations. I mean, the the, the evidence on it is a little bit, you know, mm-hmm. all over the place. But let, let's assume it's five percent. I think five percent is a good guess. So let's so five percent of one billion people living in eighteen hundred will be much lower in absolute numbers as five right. percent of eight. And one in a, and Plus one innovation. I mean, like a great innovation, then it it helps everybody. So it's yeah. it's not like oh, only that five percent or something gets it. So yeah, I, I would um, also add to that 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 uh, the analogy of using monkeys or uh, Ehrlich used butterflies and insects. Mm-hmm. You know, monkeys don't innovate. Uh, that's right. the distinction between us and every every other species. They it's, will just eat all the food until it's gone. Yeah, they don't. I mean, occasionally they humans trade. do yeah. this too, but I mean, but humans actually change their behavior. I mean, I guess animals do too in various ways, but we hopefully do it a little bit better than that. So, population growth and innovation. Now, let's talk about uh, or or the ability to innovate. What goes into that? Because you know, we've seen moments where countries have expanded or, or eras where population growth, exp- you know, grows, um, but people don't necessarily get richer. People don't necessarily live longer. Um, so it's population growth plus the ability to innovate. What are the frameworks? What are the mindsets? What are the temperaments, uh, the institutions that go into uh- that? I feel that we are on pretty solid ground when we say that innovation is uh, heavily connected to some form of freedom. Uh, I don't mean by that a libertarian paradise uh, necessarily. Even in the Soviet Union under Stalin, communists understood that they had to permit scientists a greater degree of freedom and personal dignity so that the scientists were able to contribute their brains toward the creation of the Soviet nuclear program. Throughout history, what you find is that when you have these economic efflorescences mm-hmm. of, of, of economic growth, be it in Venice or the medieval Italian states, or be it in Song, China, it usually coincides with a period of greater liberality. Uh, it doesn't have to be a necessarily a a, a, a perfectly functioning liberal democracy, um, but but it has to have some free component. After all, in China today, people are not free. Right. This is not a free country, but it is much freer than what it was under 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 right. Mao. So th- that element of liberalism, greater uh, allowance for people to, at the very least, speak 
associate, exchange information, invest is very important. Yeah. Uh, and in uh, part of the chapter that talks about, or part of the book that talks about that, you uh, cite um, uh, Matt Ridley's, uh, I, you know, the, uh, the idea of ideas having sex. Um, so that is kind of where what you're talking about is you have more people and people have some degree of greater freedom to kind of talk amongst themselves and people come up with new and interesting ideas. Yes. Yes. But they might, must also be allowed to put those ideas into mm -hmm. practice. One of my favorite examples is from ancient Rome, three different ancient Roman authors talk about the unbreakable glass uh, inventor who comes to the emperor Tiberius and tells him, I've come up with this great invention. Can I have some money, please? And Tiberius asks him, did you share this knowledge with anyone? And the inventor says no, and, he, and the inventor is put to mm -hmm. death. Throughout human history, <laughs> elites, which, which is the key here, because elites really determine which way the society goes, elites have been incredibly skeptical about invention and innovation. Whenever there was a period of economic or innovative efflorescence, mm -hmm. they tried to quash it because economic innovation and dynamism is actually very bad for totalitarian mm -hmm. control. Part of the reason why Xi is doing what he's doing in China right now is because he realized that the economic dynamism of China has been getting out of control right. and the Communist Party was falling behind in its ability to control it. So he made a conscientious choice. I'm going to squash the economy in order so that I can still control it. Yeah, you know, I and think we'll it, see how that other, plays out, right? But yeah, yeah. Yeah, the other great example is the printing press. I mean, the printing mm -hmm. press was basically invented in both China and and uh, Europe, but where did it thrive? It it was able to succeed where you had a culture that was competitive. In other words, the right. the uh, the institutions had to compete with one another, and that allowed this this window or this opportunity for this invention to become an innovation in Europe, where it was really suppressed in China. Right, so, and uh, and this also goes to the point Marion was making about we're talking about relative liberality here because it's not like the printing press was welcomed with open arms uh, right. in Europe, right? I mean, you know, no, the, it, it no, helped touch that's, off that's, uh, you know uh, hundreds of years of of war, right? Um, based on what you know what was being published to what end. Yes, but in Europe, uh, you know, printing presses take off in the uh, 15th, mm -hmm. 16th centuries, whereas the Middle East, uh, which is which is uh, the, the Ottoman Empire, has to wait until 1728 mm. when a Hungarian immigrant who converts to Islam establishes the first press in Istanbul, Constantinople back yeah. then, and he's immediately shut down. So they had to wait for a very long time. And, and during this time, Europe is able to make all of this economic progress, which leaves the Ottoman Empire right. behind. And that's how it be, that's part of the reason why, why it turns into the sick man right. of Europe. Um, final question on this before we talk about the, the critics of it. Um, is population growth necessary for long-term economic growth? Um, because, you know, Although the the world recently, you know, uh, you know, we were treated to headlines talking about how there are now eight billion people in the world, population growth, uh, the rate of population growth is slowing, and a lot of people talk about how there are really no examples of long term countries or societies with declining populations that have, you know, sustained economic growth. And the reason we care about economic growth is because it it gives, uh, you know, it increases living standards. Is uh, is part of your argument that population growth is actually necessary for superabundance? Yes. And uh, I would also say that, uh, um, but, but it's an interaction mm -hmm. between population growth and the growth of human mm -hmm. freedom. For example, you could imagine a situation 20 years from now, well, around 2060 yeah. or after, where the global population starts declining, mm -hmm. but suddenly the entire world becomes free libertarian paradise where you can say anything you can invest right. anywhere and there are no kids that is, right or fewer <laughs> kids yeah you have no time yeah. to, to 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 invent the, the point is that you could offset yeah. the decline in population by having a greater share of humanity living in freedom being right. able to fully participate in global economy and innovation but if the future around 2060 is one where the population stabilizes and then started declining and at the same time 
freedom starts disappearing from the world or is going to be restricted to right. only a few number of countries, then, of course, you would expect to see lo- lower economic growth. Could rate. I ask? Uh, yeah, and, uh, the, just yeah, go ahead. One more, I, I'd add one more thought to that. Uh, when population declines, you have this other effect of the demographic age. Mm-hmm. And it's like not only you're not having more, uh, more people, your average age is getting older. So you could end up in a, a, Jap, a Japan kind of state where the average age is much older. And Julian Simon highlighted it, that this innovation primarily comes from young people. And uh, you could have more young people to innovate, even though you've got a lot of a large population. If the average age is 65, you're not going to see innovation either. Uh, well, I was... And- Point, I would just say that we do have pretty solid studies showing that people on whom we rely most on, on technological progress, mathematicians, mm-hmm. physicians, uh, sorry, physicists, they tend to have their discoveries in their 20s and in their 30s. Mm-hmm. After that, there are very few discoveries coming down the pipeline. So young people matter, yeah. especially in I was going to uh, bring up Japan because uh, my understanding is Japan is the only OECD country that has fewer people now than in 2000. It is a, you know, it is a relatively free economy, uh, you know, against the backdrop of the world. But compared to the United States or uh, many other countries, it's a pretty structured economy. Do you feel like they are doing it wrong where they are, you know, they have a declining birth rate, they have a a sub replacement birth rate, uh, a declining population, and they're not liberalizing their economy enough? Well, we just did a little bit, a little study on Japan, and as their population tends to flatten out and then start to decline, their GDP per capita is also following that same trend, slows mm-hmm. down, flattens out, and then it's gonna it's gonna decline. I mean, uh, uh, it's still a pretty the, good place to live. Uh, it's a good place know. to live. You know, you can live. It's it, it, their life expectancy is like eighty eight in Japan, so it's yeah. a great place to live if you want to live long. But it's not that great of a place to live if you're expecting lots of new innovation and growth, and uh, that's going to be their. That's really going to be their challenge. Um, let's uh, talk about the critics of kind of progress, uh, broadly speaking, not necessarily with a capital P, but at least a small P or material progress and abundance and superabundance. Uh, historically, uh, you know, you you guys um, say that romanticism, uh, the movement that grew out of uh, generally is understood to have been a reaction to industrialization and kind of uh, the move to the nation state and to what we now call capitalism. Uh, what was going on with romanticism and what was its primary criticism and um, how does it continue to influence critics? of material progress? Well, to some extent, I think it starts with uh, Rousseau. Um, you know, both the uh, both the f- main figures of the Enlightenment, uh, or rather, the, the, the figure, all, of, all of the figures of the Enlightenment understood that life was getting better, that people were uh, increasing their income, mm-hmm. so that they could see progress around them. The, the first progressive century is the 18th right. century, really, especially toward the end. But that's basically where the agreement ended. In comes Rousseau, and, and, and he says, all this new wealth is corrupting us. The, the figures of the Enlightenment were saying, the, the other figures of the Enlightenment were saying, the more wealth you have, the better the society becomes. He who is engaged in making money is engaged in making peace. Or, uh, you know, there, there, there are... There are um, you know, from from Dr. Johnson to Adam Smith uh, to Montesquieu, uh, everybody sort of em- embraces um, a creation of wealth and prosperity as a good thing until Rousseau. And he says that it's corrupting us, that it's making us less moral. It's making us more um, separated from nature. Mm-hmm. Um, it's enslaving us. So the figures of the Enlightenment are saying that wealth is making us freer. And Rousseau is saying it's enslaving us. And and beginning with Rousseau, all the way through uh, the 19th century uh, and into the 20th, you see this argument uh, in fascism, Mm -hmm. in Nazism, in communism, um, all the way to uh, modern environmentalism. Um, Basically, it's based on this notion of of Rousseau's um, noble savage, Mm -hmm. Uh, bucolic pre-industrial paradise mm-hmm. and things like that. So, and, and I mean, obviously, that is you know heavily influenced by Christian 
you know, a Christian belief system, both in terms of, you know, a belief in the Garden of Eden, the fall, you know, of, uh, you know, eating from the tree of knowledge being kicked out of, uh, you know, Eden. And then industrialization becomes this moment where we are really separated from nature and whatnot. Um, is there a case in the early 19th century that living standards, you know, in the in the rush to industrialize, did um, life expectancy decrease? Were there, you know, were there plausible arguments to be had that this was not a good thing? Um, certainly by the time Marx dies in 1883, it's obvious that whatever there was the the, the stagnation in wages during the, the so-called Engels pause, mm-hmm. that that has disappeared, uh, that that the working classes were beginning to see a sustained increase in standards of living that was previously unknown. Right. As as early as the uh, is it the criticism of the Gotha program or is it the Communist Manifesto? Engels and Marx both of them agree that capitalism is unleashed more productive power right. in humanity uh, in 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 last 50 years than in the last yeah. in, in the previous thousands of years so they are in a way uh, fanboys of capitalism right. they just want to transcend right. it they, they want to get to what comes after it but yeah i mean in the communist manifesto this is you know the uh you know where everything solid dissolves into air and whatnot uh you know they they really talk up bourgeois society as as a yeah, and, and Communist Manifesto comes out in 1848. Mm-hmm. So, so whatever the Engels pause was in terms of incomes right. per capita, it must have become obvious to people that uh, that things were getting mm-hmm. better. 1860s, you have French historian whose name I forget right now, but who is mentioned in the book, who says that women now have more clothes that they can buy in one year than women previously in in in, in a lifetime. Mm-hmm. So by the certainly by the by the middle of 19th century it is obvious that things are getting better. And by the time that Marx dies, this is obvious. Right. Part of the reason why Lenin feels that he needs to update the Marxian theory for the 20th century is because it's obvious that poor people are not becoming poorer, they're becoming richer. Mm-hmm. And so Lenin then comes out with a theory whereby uh, poor people in the West are becoming richer as a result of exploitation right. of people in the colonies, yeah. which Marx didn't think mm-hmm. about. Uh, Marx was generally pro-colonialization as a, as a, as a project yeah. of the Enlightenment. Can I um, ask, Heidegger comes up in your book, Martin Heidegger, the German philosopher who was a member of the Nazi party um, and remains one of the most influential thinkers uh, on the planet. Um, why, why I bring him up is because he was a romantic. He was a German romantic. He you know, at, uh, shortly after the war, kind of uh, analogized industrial food production to concentration camps and was kind of like, uh, you know, the factory farming is even worse, you know, type of thing. He is also, he's an outgrowth of the German nature movement. And there are clear kind of uh, um, trends or, or thought lines that go from Rousseau and Romanticism to Heidegger to um, the modern environmentalist movement. Can you talk a little bit about how Heidegger plays in this kind of critique of the modernity that gives rise to abundance and how that kind of plays out in the modern environmentalist movement? Because it seems like there is the strongest case of people who are saying, we are destroying the planet. We are destroying Mother Gaia. I mean, they talk about all of the trends that you talk about in particularly negative terms, um, you know, that it, it seems to be the clearest case of opposition to the kind of large project that you're pushing here. So I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit leery talking about that to an actual philosopher of ideas, though, which is, which is mm-hmm. unique. Um, but uh, my reading of that particular period is that uh, as a result of Napoleonic Wars and the destruction of mm-hmm. Germany by Napoleon specifically, uh, there was a tremendous backlash against uh, what the Germans perceived to be uh, French Enlightenment. Uh, rationality and um, uh, and, and and industrialization uh, in part, and the German and uh, I guess I'm German sorry to interrupt, but I mean it's important to understand that France was the dominant economy really in Europe and in the planet, and and in terms of industrialization, you know, in America, uh, I think we 
you know, we we give France short shrift as as an economic innovator and and powerhouse, um, particularly in the nineteenth century. Yeah, but back then uh, France was the European superpower yeah. and conquered the whole of Europe uh, mm-hmm. under Napoleon. And 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 really, the, the conflicts were terribly bloody in Central Europe, in Germany, in Austria, and 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 there is this reaction amongst Germans against the French, uh, what, what they perceive as French Enlightenment, mm-hmm. specifically reason, uh, industrialization, uh, capitalism, that sort of thing, and and so from the beginning. Um, it's a it's a uh, it's an embrace of nature, uh, seeing cities specifically as the centers of corruption, um, and 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 the reason why we spent some time talking about uh, German uh, romantics is that is that in every one of these eras. It is almost as though people are looking for a reason to reject capitalism, industrialization, uh, the Enlightenment. Uh, first, it's uh, German nationalism, which, of course, then translates itself into into Nazism. Mm-hmm. But then, uh, even uh, you know, even in the existentialist movement and beyond, into into environmental movement, uh, there is always a sense that that we need something different. Than, than what capitalism has to mm. offer. And so there is a reason why all of these ideas get, get resuscitated or um, uh, get um, renewed mm. in uh, Nazism, fascism, communism, existentialism, environmentalism is because it's the obvious way with which to bludgeon capitalism and industrial and industrial work. Mm-hmm. Um, let's, uh, where, where do you see, uh, you know, the environmentalist movement going now um, in terms of, or, or is that the primary, is, is the, you know, the, the Green New Deal or is, you know, a broad-based environmentalism, is that the main foe of or opponent to a superabundance agenda? Um, or ha- how, do you, how do you seek to engage um, environmentalists, I guess, or, or, you know, people who maybe are not hardcore environmentalists, but say, you know what, I care about the planet. I care about the fate of the planet. Um, but I'm also, you know, I don't, I don't buy all of that. How do you speak to people like that to get them to, you know, to take a, a super abundance agenda seriously? I always begin uh, when talking about this subject by distinguishing between smart and well-meaning environmentalists who care about the planet, but whose hierarchy of values has the planet and human flourishing at roughly the same level, right? People like Schellenberger, uh, people like uh, Steve Pinker, um, uh, people like that. They, they care about the environment. They want a clean environment. They want a safe planet. But at the same time, they understand that that there has to be a balance. On the other hand, you've got the extreme environmentalists who really see humanity as a cancer upon the planet, as uh, having children as an act of ultimate selfishness um, and, and things like that. Uh, there are some positive things happening uh, in, in, on the environmental side of things, partly because of the catastrophe that, uh, that Europe is undergoing right mm-hmm. now. Um, the, 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 the opposition to nuclear power, for example, seems to be losing steam. People are realizing that um, that in order for civilization to continue, you have to have energy. And uh, we do have a source of energy which doesn't produce any CO2 mm-hmm. into the atmosphere, and it's nuclear. Um, so there are some positive things going on. Um, but, but at the same time, um, the megaphone is definitely still with the people claiming the coming of the apocalypse, which is why in the last chapter of the book, we are able to point to a number of a number of, uh, of public opinion polls, both in the United States and also in uh, uh, developing world or the rest of the world, uh, which shows that increasingly women and parents are putting uh, are, are making their choices about how many babies to have, depending on on environmental concerns. The world is going to burn up in twelve mm-hmm. years. We are going to run out of resources. Our children are going to starve, and as a result of that, we and and, and we think that contributes partly. Uh, to to the decrease in the fertility rates and we believe that because people tell us yeah. that we are not going to have children because the world is by empty. the same token i mean it seems that what changes fertility rates overwhelmingly is the uh you know it correlates with the years of education that women have which is widely seen as a proxy for 
equality and global equality of women is really, yes. you know, one of the unbelievable emancipatory stories, liberatory stories of, of the past two centuries as well. Yes. So the the, 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 the the fertility rates can be declining for positive and negative reasons. Right. So we are talking about uh, changes on the margin. Yeah. If people want to uh, go into businesses uh, or factories or whatever, uh, because the opportunity cost of staying at home and taking care of the children is high, well, that's their choice, right? Uh, as a classical liberal, I, yeah. I, I understand that. Uh, all I'm saying is that if on the margin you are making you are making choices because of these specific environmental concerns um this is the anti right um and could you briefly talk about why we know that the world is not running out of resources or or you know the planet is not going to burn up in you know 8 years or 12 years or 15 years well i, I would say on the resource side is uh, look at the price mm-hmm. look at the prices of things and if we were truly running out of these things, the prices would be would be increasing dramatically. So the price contains this information about the relative scarcity of things. And then the time price really goes to the next level of saying, well, how much time does it take you to earn the money to buy that thing? And all of these products and services have becoming uh, lower, lower price. They're becoming more and more abundant to us. So that mm-hmm. would be the first thing. And then, and then I think the second side, Marion can can deal with that the, the second part of the question well i mean even when it comes to climate change which is not the focus of this book we acknowledge that climate change happens we are not climate change deniers we uh, we understand there's lukewarming going on we understand the role of co2 in uh, warming of the atmosphere uh but I, I think that the key is that that people should sort of evaluate the climate change uh in uh, in the whole uh there are going to be things as a result of the of the of, of a slightly warmer world which are also going to be good for humanity uh eight times as many people die to die due to cold than ju- die due to warmth um, and so, so you know, having a slightly warmer world may actually decrease uh, the number of people who die due to climatic uh, change or variation. Uh, in addition to that, let's not forget that in the last 100 years, the number of people who have died due to extreme weather events, be it droughts or floods or uh, earthquakes, has fallen by 98%. Uh, one way I like to answer this question, I don't know if it is totally convincing, but but let me try, is that if we are going to be facing what what the environmental apocalypse are talking about, an existential crisis, an end of humanity, then we need a measure, some kind of a statistic uh, that will tell us whether in fact um, whether in fact things are getting worse or better. So one of them would be, one statistic would be how many people are dying due to extreme weather. And that has decreased by 99% over the last 100 years. In other words, we are safer from climactic changes and extreme weather events on the planet today than we were before. And I think that global enrichment has a huge part to play in it. We are basically able to build uh, sturdier buildings. We are able to estimate through satellites which way the hurricane is going to go. We have buoys at the bottom of the seas telling us when an, when an earthquake happens at the bottom of the ocean and uh, the, the, when there's going to be a tsunami. So, so by, by, by emitting CO2 into the atmosphere, we are making the world much richer, which is also making us safer. That doesn't mean that we should go crazy and emit CO2 forever in large quantities, but it does mean that it's a complex subject that people should, should consider all of its pluses and minuses. Uh, let's uh, do a little uh, biography here. I'm always curious as to why people become interested in the topics that they write about. Uh, Gail uh, Pooley, you teach at BYU Hawaii, so you are in some level of heaven already on Earth. Um, but um, you know, where did you come from, and how does it predispose you to to be interested in these kinds? You know, of I, I grew up in Idaho. My father had a gas station. Mm-hmm. And so I kind of come from this working class uh, family uh, of six children. So 1970, 1968, uh, I had to read Paul Erdick's book and I think it was junior high on the population bomb. And mm-hmm. coming from a family of six, it's like, wow, my parents are, are they responsible for the planet? Uh, planet <laughs> ending. And then uh, just this curiosity about uh, economics. Uh, I had the opportunity to meet Julian Simon mm-hmm. in 1981 when I was at uh, in grad school in econ. 
And it's like, wow, this guy uh, seems to be reasonable. And he seems to have had this experience with the facts. And uh, when he said, look, the facts are what really changed my mind. I thought, well, I'm going to look at your facts. And as I began to explore and do the research, do the really the economic analysis mm-hmm. of stuff, you know, I, I completely uh, changed my mind as well about uh, what that relationship was between resource abundance and population growth. More people result in more abundance. And that's that was Julian's yeah. uh, argument. And that's what we try to extend in the book. Yeah. And, it, you know, it's interesting in the book, you guys also, you you participate in and extend arguments that are made by people like Steven Pinker and Max Roser, you know, the idea of factfulness and facticity. Uh, obviously, Marianne, you run Human Progress, a, a website that is published by the Cato Institute. Uh, that's been a big influence on Pinker and other people like that. You, I know, uh, you know, from our, uh, our friendship, you were born in communist, uh, what became Slovakia. Um, is, you know, is a, you know, distant memories of, um, you know, of communist privation. Is that what's driving your interest in not just abundance, but super abundance? Yes. Um, I grew up in communist Czechoslovakia. I was 13 when the wall came down. Uh, after that, I lived in South Africa in the United mm-hmm. Kingdom and then in the United States. And with every step of the way, uh, my standard of living has, uh, has, has increased as, you know, I moved from one, uh, uh and well, as, as my as my freedom has increased, but the bottom line is that uh, as as a child, uh, I grew up um, um, uh, seeing the failure of socialism and. Um, mm-hmm. uh, Defense of capitalism has become very important to me. I, in other words, it's something that I feel very, very personally. Mm. Everything in the book that we do, we we document with facts and mathematics, so people will be able to see for themselves. Uh, what the evidence is, but right. the driving force certainly is the defense of the free markets. And there was some time, maybe about twenty years ago, when I realized that after this fundamental failure of communism, um, the green movement has become a home for parts of the green movement. Parts of the green movement yeah. became a home for watermelons. People who are green on the ins- uh, on the outside, but red on the inside. If you asked me ten or fifteen years ago, what is the ultimate agenda of the green um, extremists? I would mm-hmm. not give you an answer because I was taught it was hammered into me not to impugn other people's motives. We now, thankfully, live in a world where the cat is out of the bag. From the number two person at the United Nations all the way to Greta Thunberg's new book, they are explicit. The goal of the extreme environmentalist movement is the destruction of the capitalist system. Hmm. Some people may find that appealing. I don't, and I intend to fight against it. Hmm. Um, Is the, you know... um is kind of the motivation there, is it less about, you know, I mean, it's not like these people are Marxists and they are, you know, they want, they think Marx had everything right and they want to instill his version of heaven on earth or something like that. It's a, an interest in controlling things because things seem to be chaotic. Things seem to either be running down or out of control or doing the bidding of a few shadowy billionaires, you know, around the globe and things like that. And, um, you know, I, I guess one of uh, one of the larger questions I have um, for both of you is: Are we in a stage now where you know? And Joseph Schumpeter talked about this at the end of Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy, where you live in a society that becomes wealthy in a way that it takes wealth production, which has eluded humans for most of our history, for granted. And then you think the only thing that matters is how do you kind of distribute an, a a, a um, you know, a fixed set of goods to people. That's the function of economy, of economics. That's the function of of government. That's the function of civil society. Um, Is that where we're at? I mean, that people cannot see past the idea that we can have wealth creation, innovation, and growth that is not inherently destructive. Um, And that's their main failing. Uh, my, uh, I would let Gail go first because I speak too much, but I'm, I'm happy to go. Yeah, I, I would just say, you know, Marx, he felt like the production problem had been solved. His obsession was on distribution. Mm-hmm. 
So if you assume the world can produce all of this uh, wealth and abundance and it's distribution that you need to worry about, then you can become obsessed with that. But we still fundamentally have this uh, production problem. How do things get uh, made? And uh, so I I think that's a a part of the failing is recognizing. uh, And if you grow up in a a very wealthy society, if you never actually have to do things with your hands uh, and you're in academia, it's very easy to be kind of caught up in these ideas about how, uh, you know, if I was in charge, uh, given my motives and my ethics, Mm -hmm. uh, I would do it this way. And, um, uh, you know, when we allow intellectuals to have that kind of authority and and power in a culture that haven't really uh, dealt with the realities and have never really paid the costs for being wrong, then you're going to have this this attention to that kind of an ideology. So our pushback once again is, look, you've got to look at the facts. You've got to think about the historical mm-hmm. perspective of, of how expensive things used to be and why are they so abundant today? It wasn't because we have come mm-hmm. up with a new distribution uh, system. It's because we've been able to continually innovate and that requires human freedom. Yeah. Um, and I would simply add to that. Thank God that nobody had the power to stop innovation in 1900 uh, when uh, there's a famous anecdote of somebody who said that we can shut down the the, 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 the patent office in Washington, D.C. Right. because everything that could have been invented was. And that was 24 years before antibiotics came online. So the point is, thank God nobody did that. And I, I think it's it's incredibly um, silly uh, to think that we have reached the pinnacle of of prosperity it cannot get much better of course it can get much better not just for mm-hmm. people in the other parts of the world but also people for in, in in the united states and finally i would say that i mean my working hypothesis is that what is happening in in western advanced nations is that when you reach the top of the maslow pyramid of hierarchy mm-hmm. of values in other words mm-hmm. y- y- you're living in a relatively safe society or very safe society mm-hmm. uh, y- you have the food you have the water you have the shelter you have the clothing what you have the time you right? have the time you now yeah. you now have a lot of time to devote to the things at the top of the pyramid which are right. what kind of a society am i living and am i happy with that society it's self actualization so you are at the top of the pyramid and you have all this time and all you can think about is i'm living in a society with a myriad of imperfections and there is a utopia out there that i have just imagined in my head five seconds ago and i want to move the society that way and part of the reason why i think we this is the working hypothesis is that, is that we have so much conflict right now politically is because all of us are sitting at the top of the Maslow pyramid of hierarchy of values, uh, sorry, pyramid of values, uh, yep. pyramid of needs, but our values are different. Some of mm-hmm. us value freedom. Other people are valuing uh, equality and, and, we have all this time and all this energy and all this wealth to just get on each other's nerves and try to make each other more miserable. So that's a problem. So, I mean, it's fundamentally a, a problem of superabundance, it's really. It's a problem though, right? of superabundance and, yeah. and a problem of so, prosperity that we have to resolve somehow. Yeah. And, you know, is, uh, you know, one of, one of the, uh, you know, broad arguments that everybody makes, and I think, you know, it's generally correct, kind of following up on what you were talking about, Marion, is that, um, you know, we live in an era where God is dead. There, you know, there is no single transcendent set of values or morals that everybody either believes or is forced to believe or forced to pretend to believe. And so we have a proliferation of different ways of living a meaningful life, um, which leads to conflict, which leads to sniping and tribalism. Is that, um, you know, how, how do you, within the framework of superabundance, how do you how do you manage that kind of conflict so that it is productive and not destructive? Well, thankfully, in a free society, if we can manage, if we can, if we can continue to be free, there is a scope within a free society for a communist commune, where people mm-hmm. can live together uh, uh, and and share everything. So long as you have the right of exit, you can come and go and create your own kibbutz and whatever. Um, within a free society, there is a scope for a hippie commune where uh, all that people do is to, you know, canoodle naked and smoke joints. Uh, and uh, But in, so free society allows um, uh, these different, um, um, these different ideas about what best life is 
to mm-hmm. to, to flourish. Um, it's but the, the problem is that if if people who fundamentally don't believe in freedom um, and and people who mm-hmm. and, and and within freedom as classical liberals or libertarians, we are also saying we don't really know what 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 a good life is. Maybe you want to be a mm-hmm. hippie. Maybe you want to be a communist. That's okay. Uh, create your own world within within our society. Um, and unfortunately, when freedom subsides and uh, and the regulators and the central planners get hold of society, then 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 they impose their vision of any, of, on everybody else, and conflict uh, becomes greater rather than smaller. Yep. All right, we're going to leave it there. Gail Pooley, Marion Tupi, thanks for talking to Reason. The book is Superabundance. The story of population growth, innovation, and human flourishing on an infinitely bountiful planet. Thank you. Thank you, Nick, very much. It's been a pleasure.